Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Live at Five. I'm Kevin Atkison, the curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And I am here at Sarnen House in the backyard. It was a sunny and cool day. Uh, it has transformed into a gray and slightly drizzling cool day. And I know that two weeks ago we looked at the Frank Lloyd Wright Design Smith House, and we did a tour through some of the student projects that were there. Now, on Sunday, I had the kickoff lecture of Speculative Histories, which was the fourth annual exhibition uh, collaboration between the Center for Collections and Research and Cranbrook Academy of Art student and staff. Now, if you were able to join me on Sunday, you know that we had uh, uh, my co-curator, Iris Eichenberg, the head of the metalsmithing department, as well as three of the student artists, join me in a 75-minute tour through 75 works of art. The students are coming on Friday to take down their pieces, and later tonight, if realistically, not tomorrow, because the website is giving us some trouble, uh, we will launch the online version of the student show. And that's going to let you click on the pictures to expand them, to read short little essays that I've written. Uh, it will also have the lecture from Sunday there. But before it goes fully into the sort of recorded zone, I thought it would be fun to take a live walk through Sarnen House and look at some of the objects. Those of you who watch Live at Five, both on Instagram and Facebook, know that this is what we did on Instagram yesterday for our last Instagram Live at Five. But because the objects are disappearing in two days and the students really put a lot of work into them, I thought it would be fun to do a highlight reel here on Facebook Live. So the Sarnen House Courtyard, which the leaves are just beginning to come out here on all of the Japanese Barbary, uh, in this courtyard sits Kiwi's muse. Uh, and Kiwi was the great Finnish epic poet. And this sculpture that has been wrapped uh, was selected by Mrs. Sarnen and purchased by the Cranbrook Foundation around 1930. Now, Desi Terslava, uh, one of our students in the sculpture department, uh, she has wrapped Kiwi's Muse in an assortment of found clothing and fluorescent rope. Now, if this looks familial, familiar, you may remember that Desi actually wrapped a number of these sculptures last winter around the art museum. And so she's continued that process here. And I love the way that it really abstracts the sculpture and it makes Kiwi, uh, or Kiwi's muse rather, become this, this much more mysterious sort of figure where we can no longer see the difference between the stone base and the cast bronze sculpture. Now, Desi has titled this piece Christo's Muse in reference to the great uh, late Jean-Claude Christo, uh, uh, or Christo and Jean-Claude, the husband and wife team that uh, wrapped buildings like the Reichstag or the Gates in Central Park. So a little bit of uh, humor with the titling here for Christo's Muse. Now, we will next step inside the museum into the dining room. And as we come into the glorious Sarnen House dining room, we see our next contribution. Uh, this is from interim dean and artist in residence in the architecture department, Gretchen Wilkins. And what Gretchen did was uh, as she wrote, take the silver thread of Sarnen House and turn it into to a new woven globe. So it's the same dimension as our globe over there, uh, but Gretchen made it out of cast plaster. It was then polished and gold leafed. Uh, and then she, you can see that she used a golden thread to create the outline and a little golden pin there right at Detroit. And I love that this piece, when it's situated on the great uh, honey-colored golden table made of holly wood, uh, that it really becomes this 
very Art Deco-like object. It looks like something you'd find at Rockefeller Center. Now on the floor below Gretchen's piece are two uh, uh, mirrors by Forrest Hughes from the 3D or uh, uh, product industrial design department at Cranbrook. And what's neat about these mirrors is that they begin to reflect the sort of woodworking and mechanics of the actual table. So you can see in the reflection of his wood, uh, the way that this table expands and functions. And it gives us a whole new view of the house through these mirrors. Now, stepping into the butler's pantry, the head of the sculpture department, Rebecca Ripple, uh, has contributed this work, which is made out of aluminum wire. And the aluminum wire, when you see it, it may just look sort of like it's crumpled up, but upon closer inspection, uh, you can see that it is a, a phrase, a sentence, and it starts with you are, and once our website is finished and uploaded, you can click on this piece and try and figure out exactly what it says, but it's meant to sort of engage in the labor of, of reading into the artist process. What I love about this piece is it's not just the sentence written six times, but she's actually woven the letters together. So you can see how there the R weaves into the T and it becomes this strange sort of uh, wire textile. Stepping out and around from the butler's pantry, and we'll, we'll not talk about every object today, you can head over and watch the um, uh, video lecture that I gave on Sunday where I do discuss every student art piece. Here in the book room where Mrs. Sarnen would sit and work on her hand loom where Aliel did his correspondence, it's also a place where the, we know the grandchildren uh, like to play. And Annie Meyer from the uh, 2D or 3D, one of the design departments, uh, created this strange little game here on the table. And it's really meant to make you think about how exactly you're supposed to play with these objects. Uh, she was inspired by the, the fact that the grandkids would use their uh, matchbox cars and they would run races on Loya Saarinen's designs for the rugs. Uh, but here, they're just sort of wooden objects that you can play with and sort of rearrange in different groupings and sort of create your own mysterious origin uh, or, or logic behind these pieces. And Annie was interested in thinking about how objects might be non-binary or fluid and how they might express different sort of uh, uh, meaning to the individual viewer. Now, on the window ledge where Mrs. Sarnen would display the art objects that she collected, uh, she collected contemporary art while Aliel usually collected Finnish antiques. We see Cooper Siegel's vessel where he was inspired by the French uh, Atelier Primavera vase here, which was created on the potter's wheel and then using a glaze with a comb uh, where the potter then combed off the uh, uh, glaze to create this signature Atelier Primavera finish. What Cooper was interested in was sort of creating a, another version of it, except this time he has done it through sort of stacked pancake forms of glazed and unglazed ceramic. And so instead of raking his glaze, he begins to stack them up uh, uh, unglazed, glazed, unglazed, and glazed. And then the entire piece slumped over in the kiln, and so it's attached to the kiln brick. And it forms this sort of, um, I think, quite comical mirror of the Primavera vase in a, a very different method of construction. Over here, uh, Victor Schreckengost, wonderful Pegasus, has been given a new meadow as he uh, runs about the library. The great Cleveland Art Deco ceramicist uh, did the Pegasus, and Kelly Croner in our fiber department quilted this meadow for the Pegasus. And then 
quite subtly, uh, almost as much a performance art piece as a sculpture itself. McQuinna Quant from the sculpture department decided, well, what if the Sarnins just had a different book in the library? So among the books in Finnish, German, French, Russian, Swedish, and English, all the languages the Sarnins spoke, that are all in these beautiful gold and leather bindings, uh, slipped in is a Cook's Tour of Iowa, uh, which the artist McKenna is from Iowa, and she bought this down at John King uh, because she's from Iowa, and then imagine her surprise when she opened it up and she actually found a photograph of her grandfather in the cookbook. And so the theme of the show is speculative histories, imagining new stories for the houses, and her uh, pretty subtle piece was to slip that into uh, the Sarnin's library. Now, across the way, where uh, usually the reproduction of Helene Schefferbeck's uh, uh, pastel drawing of a woman in a rocker hangs. Malik Purvis from the painting department was intrigued when I told the, the visiting students about how the walls were so faded. And I told them this because in an earlier project, uh, we had hung paintings that were uh, by Jason Carter, and he intended them to be the exact size of the paintings he was replacing, but they were all a little bit too small, and it ended up, I mean, it was pretty obvious to be able to see where that they were too small, and so I told the students, you know, be careful with your measurements, overshoot it. Malik did something entirely different, which was, no, no, celebrate the fact that Helene Schefferbeek's uh, pa uh, pastel, this inert object was able to create a sort of profound impact on the wall through just the, the uh, uh, duration, the, t the combination of time and sunlight. And so he wanted to, instead of replacing that painting, to frame the memory of that painting. And so he really celebrates the fading of our wall covering and gives it its own frame that's then get, uh, uh, you see this, uh, Japanese lacquer finish. Now, we looked at these last week at Edison House, some of these um, speculative cell phones by Elizabeth Diamond in the ceramics department. And here you can see that we are getting a call from Frank Lloyd Wright and Aliel Saarinen. Uh, they're situated here outside of Saarinen House on this funny little ceramic iPhone. Now, some of the calls are coming from uh, uh, friends like Frank Lloyd Wright. Others were coming from me. There is a phone showing a live at five. Now, in the uh, sitting room here, in what the room Loya Sarnin called the cozy corner, we have Aero uh, Sarnin's childhood dolls from Germany and France, and they are now facing off of two new dolls who are made out of coal. And so these sculptures made by metalsmithing student Gloria Wynn sit on a little hooked rug by Gloria that is in this sort of fiery color palette. And then the two coal figures have this face off with their uh, uh, other friends across the way. A little, a slightly creepy combination. No creepier than the dolls are on a daily basis. Now, this is a painting by the Detroit-born Wally Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell came to Cranbrook as instructor in watercolors around 1932. Uh, he was then director of the Art Museum and finally president of Cranbrook. He did this in the 30s. The Sarnins purchased it, hung it here. On the other side, our current co-head of the painting department, Martha Maisko, has taken a image of the Wally Mitchell painting. So we see the same flowers from Wally Mitchell. She's adjusted the colors in Photoshop or on the computer. And then she painted silk flowers and put those silk flowers onto a flatbed scanner. She then combines Wally Mitchell's paintings, her scanned painted flowers, as well as a photograph of the cozy corner by James Hafner, and she prints it digitally onto a sheet of aluminum. And so it is this sort of manipulated memory of the cozy corner in a new work of art. And we see 
around the other side, again, a view of the inspiration piece. Now, I'm joined here in the studio by three uh, grandmas, uh, three babushkas who are sitting here. This piece is another uh, contribution from Desi, who did the courtyard wrapping, uh, and it's entitled Only Grandma Can Judge Me. And you'll see that the babushkas are, uh, they have their head wraps on, but they are themselves security cameras, and they're sort of flashing endlessly staring at each other. Uh, and they are held in these little concrete cast uh, Bulgarian cheese containers. So uh, mini eclairs, Bulgarian white uh, brine sheep's milk cheeses. Along the wall here, replacing the usual Finnish antique tapestry is a piece by Iris Eichenberg, my co-collaborator in this show and head of the metalsmithing department. And Iris created this hooked rug out of leftover wool yarns from the Cranbrook, from a Cranbrook weaver who was here in the 60s and 70s. And so they have this very 60s color palette. And it is this sort of interesting material story uh, where the materials were here on campus, they were never used on campus, they were then donated back to Cranbrook, and Iris uh, uses them to finally create a hanging or a rug, uh, this time inspired by the sort of farm landscape of her native southern Germany. And that replaced uh, a much older hanging from Finland. Now, looking across the studio on chairs designed by a young Aero Saarinen, uh, we see the work of Zahara Aljamidi, who uh, decided to celebrate something that as a curator, I wish she had it. Uh, she calls out some of the stains on these chairs using pins and pearls. And so she creates these um, growths around the different stains. And everywhere that there was a stain, she then marks with a pinhead. And you'll see that each of the chairs have a different sort of density and pattern. One of the most beautiful pieces in the show is from Claire, uh, uh, Claire Thibault from the ceramics department who created the peony vase that I showed you last week in Edison House, but here it is uh, situated on the piano. It's an eight fired porcelain piece uh, you shouldn't fire porcelain eight times, but if you are a student and you're unhappy with your vase, uh, she sort of kept adding, kept glazing, coloring, uh, developing the peonies, developing the glaze, all the way up to the opening of the show when it took on this green tint that so beautifully coordinates with the, uh, or the green tint that coordinates with the green of the studio. And then our last piece here in the uh, studio is by Doug Jones, who is in the print media department, and he has created a new tableau. He was inspired by what I had done as the curator here on the desk, which was sort of create uh, a situation of Aliel's reproduction drawings, some historic Cranbrook photographs, the historic Kingswood urn, and he added in this swan print, uh, inspired by both the, the sort of prominence of swans in Finnish uh, fairy tales and Finnish stories, as well as swans here at Cranbrook, uh, where the Kingswood swans are, are a, of great importance and sorely missed. He then paired it with a bookmark, as well as a new book that Aliel might be reading, W.E.B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk, which was written around the same time that George Booth wrote The Pleasures of Planting. Uh, and so it has this sort of combination to uh, what the Booths and the Sarnans were doing. And, oh, it looks like we're getting another phone call, this time from a very handsome young Aliel Sarnan. Now, I'll head upstairs next to just highlight a few other objects. If you're just joining us, we are today looking at the final days of speculative histories being installed in the house. If you think, I didn't hear about that show, I didn't get to go to it. It was never open to the public. It is an entirely virtual show, uh, but the objects are real objects and really in the house. So, 
Uh, the virtual experience exists as a lecture that is on YouTube and as a virtual gallery that will go live on the Center's website later tonight. We are taking a look at some of the pieces before the artists come and pick them up. It is a little bit hard to, or, or uh, less enjoyable to see the pieces on Facebook Live than it is through the beautiful photographs by Eric Perry, who generously came out uh, and photographed all of the student projects. In the closet here, we see an ear uh, from one of the students whose name is escaping me, I'm sorry, uh, but she is sort of interested in thinking about what you would hear in the house and sort of uh, what kind of conversations are hidden in the closet. Now, uh, here, alongside another one of our Finnish antiques, we see a new uh, uh, blanket designed by Julian Jones from the print media department, uh, or photography, rather. And he's inspired by Russian constructivist design and the sort of very modern manufacturing technique of designing within a computer program and having it woven by jacquard looms in the Carolinas uh, in the sort of distinctly more modern method of production than what we uh, see here at Cranbrook with pieces like the curtains, which were, of course, designed on campus and woven on campus. Now, here we see a great glass blueberry powder container, which is meant to be read as a bead. And so it is a two-part work where down here, Meredith uh, uh, Morrison has given us the glass bead woven textile uh, that's sort of rolled up here. And then a single glass bead here, with, which is filled of blueberry powder. It's what Meredith eats for breakfast every morning. And she thought that putting it here in the breakfast nook of the house uh, would cause us to sur sort of consider the ritual of breakfast, uh, the ritual of eating the same thing every day and sort of watching the powder go down. In a uh, funny uh, uh, parallel, the curtains here are actually dyed with blueberry dye. And yes, the ear is by Rebecca France. Thank you, Julie, for reminding me. Uh, here in the corner from the head of our fiber department, Mark Newport, he uh, brought over one of his signature mending projects where he uses a scrap of fabric that has a hole in it and then he hand uh, embroiders, he hand mends in the very traditional uh, uh, manner trying to recreate the textile through handiwork and sort of the celebration of mending. Now, along the floor here is the long computer-generated love letter between Aero Saarinen and Aileen Lusheim, who would become his second wife. And if I step around, we will see that it starts down at the bottom and what Vikram did, who's in our 4D design department, uh, was he entered in a number of love letters that are digitized over on the Smithsonian website and then used computer learning to fabricate new love letters as a way of bringing back to the house the sort of personality of the Sarnins. Now, these love letters, which are a little bit nonsensical overall, uh, are written by this machine here. And so this robotic uh, computer-driven uh, device uses counterweights hanging down uh, to then pull up and down this single felt tip pin. And so this is actually what does the writing of the computer-generated love letters. Along the vanity set with the beautiful mirrors and lights by designed by a young Aero Saarinen, uh, Alex Ukma has replaced Loya Saarinen's silver and ebony uh, hair tools, dressing tools, with a series of products that are used for textured hair. And Alex was interested in what if a black family had lived here in Saarinen House, 
And so she not only brought in tools that are used on textured or black hair, uh, but she also brought in the sort of sounds and the phrases that are associated with the use of the tools. So from the hot iron, uh, which is laser etched with hold your ear, which is what mothers or, or hairdressers will say to young ladies as they use the hot iron, hold your ear so that you don't burn yourself, to waves on swim, the pick says to the roots, which has of course multiple meanings, uh, then the comb tilt your head, and then this, the wide tooth comb says you tender headed. Uh, because the wide tooth comb, you know, if it starts to hurt you, then, then they'll say you tender headed. And so I love that she brings not only this sort of one-to-one -one replacement of Loya Saarinen's dresser set uh, with a very different line of products, but that she also brings in these, these phrases uh, into the house and really speculates on what would happen if Cranbrook uh, didn't have a legacy of, of all-white leadership. There's your curator. Uh, now, on the other side of the room... Uh, in Loya Sarnan's closet, we have the fleshy uh, bodysuit. And so you have feet down at the bottom, then you have the bodysuit hanging here among the clothes of Pipson, Sarnan, Swanson, uh, some nice hands, and then up at the top, uh, this lovely face. I don't know how I sleep at night with this in my house, but here we are. Along the beds uh, are a series of objects from Melika in the sculpture department, and she was interested in creating a sort of form language of individual objects uh, that don't have a sort of explicit meaning, but begin to sort of talk to each other across the bed. The last objects that we'll look at are here in the master bathroom. That is the bath mat that Loya Saarinen designed and had woven for use here in Saarinen House. And we'll see that Kaya uh, McCormick in the 2D design department uh, has recreated the bath mat in a piece that she calls Loya's Lagoon. And Loya's Lagoon is made to sort of reference the idea of the bath and water and cleansing oneself, but it also is made entirely out of aquarium pebbles. And so it took her from about uh, 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. to hand lay all of these aquarium pebbles. Uh, she did a pretty amazing job to match the design of the bath mat in aquarium pebbles. And she used this very different color scheme as a way of uh, calling attention to this sort of high contrast, both contrasting between the red and green, but also contrasting from the very neutral tones of the bathroom. There are two other pieces in here, and then we'll finish our sort of speculative histories highlight tour. Uh, Lyric Shin created this strange steel and cast creature uh, that appears to be walking across the bathroom counter into the drain. Uh, and then on the other side of the room, uh, Rachel Pontius, who's a 2017 graduate of the painting department and currently works in our library, uh, created this ode to Pipson, the Saarinen's daughter. And that glass there is one of Pipson's most famous designs for Tiffin Glass in Ohio. Uh, and you'll see it has a little bit of wine and a little red lipstick mark on the glass. And then she created the sort of uh, variation of the bathroom tiles. So I hope you enjoyed this quick behind-the-scenes tour of the Speculative Histories show here at Sarnen House. Uh, I have a sign-up just in case security or facilities come through. They don't walk across the aquarium pebbles. Um, the show extended between Saarinen House, Cranbrook House, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. Over 75 artists participated. It was a delight to work with them. I want to thank them again for all of their 
efforts and for the hard work that they put in in creating these pieces into envisioning histories to celebrating stories uh, real imagined idealized uh, it was a, a, a broad swath of participant uh, engagement with really whatever element of the house history and Cranbrook history they wanted to think about uh, the online gallery should be live by tomorrow uh, and then the YouTube tour will be as, uh, on our website center.cranbrook.edu so you can learn more about it there. I'll be back next Wednesday for another Live at 5. In the meantime, you should head over to center.cranbrook.edu, look at this lecture, sign up for the upcoming Bowder lectures, which are going to be about uh, are a series of three lectures about redlining in Detroit, about indigenous people in Detroit, and um, about the Japanese gardens of uh, the internment camps of World War II. So that series is coming up in April. And then, of course, on May 22nd, we'll have a house party at Cranbrook, which is our annual fundraiser. And I am busy uh, writing and producing a 45-minute film about Carl Millis for that fundraiser. So make sure you sign up uh, and get your tickets either as a viewer or as a patron on our website. Um, the, the viewer tickets are just $50 each. It is our fundraiser, so if you can support us at a higher level, you can join us for a dinner that's brought to your home, uh, all the way up to different benefit packages. So whatever you can do to support the Center for Collections and Research in our annual fundraiser, you're going to hear a lot more about it on upcoming Live at 5.